All right, let's go ahead and begin. We had a snow day on Friday. Hopefully you kept warm and did something interesting. Um, I put a recorded lecture video online. I hope that you watched that. Today's class meeting will make more sense if you did. Uh, and if you didn't, then go back and do it today, please. Uh, we'll probably have a quiz sometime in the next week or so, uh, maybe a week or two weeks. Um, the idea being that somewhere in the midpoint between the beginning of the semester and our first midterm exam, we'll have a quiz that's only worth 1% of your final grade, uh, just as kind of a check of your understanding and a low stakes way of assessing where things are before the exam comes around. All right, so homework number two is due on Wednesday. And uh, we'll work through two examples that I think will continue to support your efforts on homework two. And uh, what we're going to be doing is an example that compares the various empirical resistance formulas that were introduced in the recorded lecture on Friday of last week. So we'll do an example related to that and then another example where we're sizing the diameter of a pipe that's needed when we throw a pump into the mix just to see how uh, gravity flow, which we did before, compares to when a pump is added and is contributing energy between the two points. So does anybody have schedule or announcement related questions before we move on? All right, let's recap. What's the name of this equation? That's right. Good, James. That's the energy equation. Yeah. So what we've been doing in the last couple of class meetings is discussing ways to estimate the energy loss due to pipe friction, H sub F. And everything else in the energy equation we can calculate directly or would be given in a problem statement. But H sub F requires a little bit of finesse. It's something that we have to often iterate and sometimes jump through some hoops to estimate. And the best and most accurate way to estimate head loss due to pipe friction is the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. But what is the restriction or what's the consideration that's unique with the Darcy-Wiesbach equation? What makes it tricky? Good, the friction factor, that's right. So all the other things in the Darcy-Wiesbach equation are just uh, constants that would be defined at the beginning of a problem. But what is it about the friction factor? Like why is it tricky? What's the hard thing about determining the friction factor? What's that? Okay, the Moody diagram is one way. Um, and what's tricky about that? Yeah, it, it's a little bit of visual interpre uh, in interpretation, yeah. More generally, the thing that makes estimating the friction factor difficult is that the friction factor depends on the flow velocity, remember, because uh, it includes Reynolds number as one of the terms whether you're using the Jane equation or the Colbrick equation or the Moody diagrams, the Reynolds number is one of the factors that determines the friction factor F. And so you don't know F until you know the flow conditions, but you don't know the flow conditions until you know F. And so sometimes it's this chicken and the egg scenario where um, you've got two unknowns and you have to begin by assuming something and then close the loop by iterating. Sometimes the problem state won't give you the velocity directly, and even still, it's trickier to estimate F than it would be for some of the other methods. But that's just a review of why we like, like the Darcy-Wiesbach equation is because of its precision. And you know what we're saying is a problem with the F value? Actually, that's not a problem at all. That's not a bug, so to speak. That's a feature. The fact that the friction factor adapts to the flow conditions and it adapts to the material roughness relative to the pipe diameter, that's what makes it the most accurate, is that the F value is dynamic and that it responds to the flow condition. So it's not like it otherwise would be a great 
method, but except for this one problem. No, it's, it's that thing that makes it so accurate, is that it's sensitive to changing flow conditions. Hazen-Williams equation is less accurate, and the reason why it's less accurate is because the friction factor, this C sub H, is constant. It stays the same regardless of the flow velocity. It stays the same regardless of the pipe diameter. And so it's this constant C value that makes it easier. So it's less accurate, but it's easier to, to calculate. So these are the two main methods that we would use for closed conduit flow. We'll also, in an example today, use the Manning's equation, but really the Manning's equation is used primarily for open channel flow. And the rare occasion it's used for closed conduit flow would be typically for culverts. And then even still, it's, it's not that accurate compared to the other methods. So are there any questions about the concepts that we've just gone over in this brief review? The recorded lecture on Friday I showed you these two equations for the Hazen-Williams equation. You'll notice that if you're working in SI units, it looks different than you're working in British, British gravitational units. You can rearrange darcy Wiesbach equation to solve for V. So I also showed you that is, you know, if we have a known diameter, length, if we know the head loss, then we can find out what would be the flow velocity through a pipe under certain conditions. Okay, so if, if this is new information for you today, like if you didn't know most of what I just said, that's a problem. Okay? So, um, maybe go back through the, the book, read the videos, but <coughs> if this wasn't review, if this was new information, then that should be uh, the alarm bells I hope are going off. Let's, um, work through an example where we compare and contrast these different methods and um, the, the purpose here is just to see how much different is the Manning's equation and the Hayes and Williams equation to what we know is the most accurate approach. The Darcy Wiesbrock is the most accurate and let's see how close the others will get. What we have is water flowing through a pipe at a velocity of one meter per second. So the pipe in question is ductile iron, and it's new ductile iron because the age of the ductile iron affects the roughness. If you go into the tables, you'll find a different uh, C sub H value or N value or K sub S, depending on the condition of the ductile iron. So it's 150 millimeter diameter, and we want to know how much head loss due to pipe friction is there across a length of 500 meters. So these are the three methods that we're going to use. First of all, Hayes and Williams equation where for ductile iron that's new, we'd use a C sub H value of 130. The Manning's equation, the N value that applies for ductile iron material is 0 0.013. And then for the case of Darcy Wiesbach, it won't just be an immediate substitution because first we're going to have to determine the friction factor F. And to find the friction factor, you'll have to calculate the Reynolds number. And you'll notice here in the problem statement, I've reminded you what's the typical kinematic viscosity of water for uh, unspecified water temperature, 1 times 10 to the minus 6. And of course, we know that the Reynolds number is the velocity of the flow multiplied by the diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity. So for this last one, for Darcy Wiesbach, you'll calculate the friction factor with the given K sub S, with the given diameter, with the Reynolds number that you'll calculate. And then this Jane equation will determine the F value that you can put into Darcy Wiesbach. Okay, I'm gonna pause. We've got plenty of time for you to work on this one, so I want you to get practice with all three methods. I'll circulate around the classroom. I've got the solution if you wanna check your answer and see if you've got the right numbers. Okay, this is a Goldilocks situation here where one of them is going to be too low, one of them is going to be too high, and then, of course, the Darcy Wiesbach equation is just right. Uh, I hope what you find is that when you substitute in the C value, the diameter, the velocity, the length, and so on, you should get that the Hazen-Williams estimated head loss 
is 3.85 meters. Everybody get that? 3.85 meters? Good. Manning's equation is similarly straightforward, where when you put in the n value, along with the length, velocity, and diameter, then you get 6.73 meters. So if we just pause for a second and think about the scale of that difference, it's basically double. Double the head loss is what the Hayes and Williams equation had estimated. Um, and then the one that we know is the most accurate because it's the most sensitive to the precise flow conditions in question, the Darcy Wiesbach equation, we have to start off by determining the F value. So the Jane equation is simpler than going all the way with the Colebrook. And for most flow conditions, the Jane equation will be acceptably accurate. So uh, the Reynolds number is 1.5 times 10 to the fifth. And then when we put the Reynolds number into the Jane equation, we should get an F value of 0 0.0240. And then putting that into the H sub F equation, we get 4.08 meters. Let me just uh, mention that I think it's a good habit to write the units in every step of a calculation. You're less likely to make mistakes if you write the units along with the number um, in those intermediate steps because Oftentimes, if you write the units and it happens to be like you've accidentally written diameter as millimeters when it should be as meters, you'll notice it. You're more likely to notice it if you do take the time to write the units. And then the other advantage of writing the units is it makes it more clear what you actually were doing. And most people in here on the exams are going to make a mistake or two through the semester. And the more I understand what your thinking was, the more partial credit you can get. And so I'd encourage you to write the units in your in intermediate steps. And I'll try and model that through my examples. You'll notice here that I don't just write 500 for the length. I write 500 meters. And for the diameter, I just don't write 0.15, but I have 0 0.150 meters. And so anything that has units, I think you should write the units along with the number in those intermediate steps. Any questions about the example? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I get confused sometimes when you plug it in your diameter. Sometimes you leave it in millimeters, and sometimes you convert it to meters. Right. So you, you want to know why. Or is it more like, is it just like one instance when you leave it? The, the main, what you'll notice is the main time I leave um, diameter as millimeters is in this ratio right here. And the reason why is I know that the numerator and the denominator need to be in the same units for it to cancel out. And so I could write it both in meters or I could use it both in millimeters. But the reason why I, in this case, stuck with millimeters is I don't just like writing all the extra zeros in front of the k sub s. You know, I don't want to ch bother changing the k sub s from millimeters to meters. But you could go either way. Um, in a ratio, you could leave the units as millimeters. I'm glad you asked that question. That's not a dumb question at all. Any other questions? All right. Can you scroll down a little bit? Mm-hmm. Yep. OK. So you know the FE exam. Has anybody here already taken the FE exam? You should be thinking about that. And uh, there are plenty of problems on the FE exam where you use the Hayes and Williams equation because it's quick. And on average, those problems on the FE need to last only between three and four minutes. So it's good to know the Hayes and Williams equation. Is the university still covering the cost of the exam if you pass it? Yeah, if you pass the exam, then we'll reimburse you. We'll still reimburse you. Yep. So that gives you some incentive to pass. I mean, alongside with the fact that engineering licensure is worth a lot more than $225. You know, you get a big pay increase if 
you're on the path to becoming a licensed professional engineer. Um, I never thought of it this way, but we had an outside speaker and senior seminar this past fall from the Department of Highways, and he said he thinks people should take the FE exam during their junior year. And at first I was surprised because I usually thought of it as something that seniors take, but he made a pretty good case that if you look at the problems on that test, um, if you wait till your senior year, it's been a fair amount of time since you've had calculus, chemistry, maybe engineering economy, statics, dynamics, and there's a lot of questions on there that are freshman and sophomore level questions. And, uh, you know, there are a handful of questions related to structural analysis, but that's also a junior level class. Fluid mechanics is on there, hydraulic engineering is on there, environmental, but there's not likely to be like design elective questions. So maybe you are better off taking it as a junior while some of those questions are still, let uh, the content's fresh in your mind. Okay, um, so that is our comparison example. And um, we're going to work one more example. And I've put a template file on Blackboard. So if you have your computer, I'd encourage you to get it out and download that template file. Because what we're going to do is work through an example where we're applying the energy equation in a situation where there is a pump that's adding additional head to the system. So the, uh, the template file that I've put on Blackboard, I think there's a, uh, a subfolder that has just Excel templates. And it'll be the second one in there at the bottom of the list. OK, so um, let's talk about this. It's a reservoir that is down below is the source of the water. What does this triangle mean? Does, does anybody remember the significance of this triangle? Right there. Atmospheric pressure. Good. That's exactly right. It means that the tank is open to the atmosphere. So that gives us a location where we know the pressure is zero. So at the water surface, you know, the arrow here is saying this is location one. Because in the energy equation, flow goes from one towards two. There's a direction in the energy equation. And the reason why there's a direction is because we put the pump term on the left-hand side of the equation, and we put the head loss term on the right-hand side of the equation. So anything that's adding energy gets added to the left side. Anything that is taking energy out of the system, it's on the right-hand side of the equation. So water is flowing from one, this lower reservoir, towards two. And the uh, the water in tank two is also at atmospheric. It's got a triangle at the surface there. So we know some things. We know that the pressure at one is zero. We could say that Z1 is zero, because we're going to say that that's our reference elevation. And then we would define Z2 as 35 meters, because it we're, we're told the elevation difference between the two. Um, the velocity in the tank is zero. Of course, that's not to say the velocity through the pipe is zero, but velocity through the pipe is different than the velocity at location one. So what we're going to do is start off by just doing some calculations uh, on the whiteboard, and then we'll switch over to the um, We'll switch over to the spreadsheet in a moment. So water's flowing because there's a pump there. Ordinarily, water wouldn't flow uphill. But we've added a pump that pressurizes the water and uh, drives it up above that elevation gradient. And the pump is overcoming the resistance of uh, energy loss due to pipe friction. So that 10 horsepower pump uh, we can find out how much pump head is being added with this pump equation here. The pump equation says that um, the horsepower of a pump is the unit weight of the liquid multiplied by the flow rate multiplied by the pump head divided by 550. And 550 is 
there's 550 foot-pounds per horsepower. That's the definition of a horsepower, is 550 uh, foot-pounds per horsepower. Uh, foot-pounds per second, sorry. OK, so um, if HP is gamma times Q times pump head divided by 550 foot pounds per second per horsepower, then we can rearrange that equation because we want to know how much pump head is that pump adding to the system. See, we want to add here H sub P on the left hand side of the energy equation. We want to know how much pump head is that pump adding. And we can't just put 10 horsepower because that's not the pump head. Uh, let's rearrange this equation. The pump head H sub P is 550 times the horsepower divided by the unit weight of the fluid multiplied by the flow rate. All right, so that is 550 times 10 horsepower, 550 foot pounds per second per horsepower, multiplied by 10 horsepower, divided by the unit weight of water in traditional units is 62.4 pounds of force per cubic foot of water. And the flow rate here is 1.5 cubic feet per second. So the amount of pump head that's being added depends on the flow rate. It depends on the unit weight of the liquid in question and the horsepower of the pump. So if we put all those calculations in, uh, we'll find that that is uh, 58.76 feet. That's the, uh, the head added by the pump. And let me pull that up on the screen just so the viewers, after the fact, have that available. All right, so here's our pump head calculations. So that's why the water is flowing from one to two. If the pump wasn't there doing that, the water would actually be flowing the opposite direction, unless there was a valve that was closed. But the pump is lifting the water. And how does a pump add energy? It adds energy by increasing pressure. If we looked at the pressure before the pump compared to the pressure after the pump, it's going to be a sudden increase in pressure. So the effect of that is that the water is flowing with some velocity through the pipe, but the pump is actually increasing the pressure from the upstream end to the downstream end. So if we look at the diagram again, water's flowing from one to two. There's this increase in pressure due to the pump. Okay, so. We know what is the pump head. Now let's put that into the energy equation and find out um, how much head loss is there. Is it okay if I erase this off of the whiteboard? Everybody's got that? We used to have classes over in the lab building, and there was this beautiful large whiteboard there. It was the promised land in terms of having plenty of real estate to write up long examples. Um, all right, so here's the energy equation. P1 divided by gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared divided by 2G plus the pump head H sub P is equal to P2 divided by gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared divided by 2G plus <coughs> the energy loss due to pipe friction H sub F. All right, so water flows from 1 towards 2. And at location one, we know that the pressure is zero because it's atmospheric at one and at two. Uh, the velocity of the water at the surface of the tank is zero. So we can cancel out the velocity head terms at both locations. 
we're going to say let z1 equals 0. And so that is 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus the pump head, which we just calculated is 58.76 feet is equal to 0 plus 35 feet. That's the elevation of the water at location 2. Plus there's no velocity head at 2 plus h sub f. So what we're calculating, h sub f, there is 23.76 feet of head available to drive the water through the pipe. Um, the pump is adding 58.76 feet of head. 35 of it goes to the elevation change. So 23.76 is left over to overcome pipe friction. So it's the driving force. The pump is adding the energy. The system is taking the energy. The elevation difference is 35 meters uh, feet of that energy being used up. And so there's 23.76 feet of energy available to cause the flow. And where is that going? It's overcoming the resistance due to pipe friction. So let me just quickly show the rest of these calculations on here. And then we're going to go to that template file. All right. So this is the template that's available on Blackboard. And um, we'll just put in the things that we know about the system here. Uh, it's 10 horsepower. The um, pipe equivalent sand roughness for the material that we've got here, um, cast iron, the epsilon is 0 .00085 feet. Okay, so 0 .00085 feet. The unit weight of water, 62.37 pounds of force per cubic foot. The kinematic viscosity of water in traditional units is 1.22 times 10 to the minus 5 feet squared per second. The flow rate that we're told in the problem statement, we want to know how big does the pipe diameter have to be so that we can have 1.5 cubic feet per second going through there. So 1.5, I'm sorry, yeah, cubic feet per second. Uh, the pump head we calculated earlier with our hand calculations is 58.79 feet. And then the head loss due to pipe friction 23.76 G in traditional units is 32.2 feet per second squared. And then the length of the pipe is 800 feet. All right, in our first iteration, uh, we're just going to pick an F value. Now, the truth is we could do a little bit better than that. And I'll tell you about the fully turbulent flow assumption in a future lecture. And if you use the fully turbulent flow assumption, it'll give you a better guess for the initial F value than just guessing something at random. But I don't want to use it yet because I just want to illustrate that even with a pretty bad guess for the F value, it'll still converge really quickly. So let's just say 0 0.01 is our guess for the F value in this first iteration. So 0 0.01 is a little bit on the low side it would be uncommon to have an F value that low. Okay, so now what is the F value that is needed for a uh, diameter of that size, or the, for that F value in these flow conditions? We're going to use this. This equation that we're about to write, does anybody know what equation that is? We've transformed it a little bit, but you should just be able to look at it and see like what are the terms in there. This is the uh, Darcy-Wiesbach equation. It's just the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. The hint is that it's got h sub f 
F value L. Now the Darcy Wiesbach equation um, is generally written in terms of velocity, but here we just said we can also write it in terms of flow rate Q as long as we have the area of the <coughs> pipe also in the equation. So that's why there's a pi in there is we've instead of having uh, V squared, that's the same as Q squared divided by A squared. So we said, let's substitute in Q squared and A squared instead of V squared. So here's the Darcy Wiesbach equation. I'm telling you that this equation, we've transformed it. That is the same thing, just solving for D instead of solving for H sub F, because we know H sub F in this problem. So that's where this one comes from. It's the Darcy Wiesbach equation. So let's say, what should the diameter be if these are our values? All right, so, you know, Excel does an interesting thing. Depending on how far zoomed in you are, it sometimes won't let you click on certain cells. There we go. All right, so equals 8 times the F value times the length. And I'm going to anchor the reference to the length by pressing F4 times the flow rate. Anchor that and square it. And now divide it by the H sub F. Anchor that reference times G. Anchor the reference times pi squared, pi, open, close, parentheses, squared. And then close that, 2, and then to the power of 0.2. OK, so if the uh, friction factor is 0 0.01, then the needed diameter would be 0 0.4530. And um, now if that's the diameter, then the cross-sectional area will be pi d squared divided by 4. So equals pi times d squared divided by 4. OK, so that's the cross-sectional area. And the velocity is q divided by the area. So that's the velocity, 9.31 feet per second. And then the Reynolds number will be the velocity times the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. And up here at the top, we've got the kinematic viscosity there. So it's velocity times diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. And I'm going to anchor the reference up to the kinematic viscosity. The reason for the anchored references is I should be able to copy and paste these formulas in subsequent iterations so I don't have to type the formulas over and over again. You know, as long as I've got the relative references in the right place, then I can copy and paste without having to update. The only thing I'll have to calculate fresh in iteration two will be the F value. Okay, so what this is saying is with a guess value of 0 0.01 for the friction factor, then this would be the diameter of the pipe that's needed. And all the rest of these calculations, like the area, velocity, and Reynolds number, I only bother calculating those because I know there's going to be an iteration two. And for iteration two, instead of just guessing the F value, I don't want to just guess. I want to do better than guess. And this time, for iteration two, I'm going to use the Jane equation to calculate the F value. Any questions so far about what we've done? Or does anybody need to see one of the formulas up to this point? All right, so now for the Jane equation, I'm going to say equals 1.325 divided by, you know what? I will turn off the centering because that makes it harder to see the formula if it's centered. All right equals 1.325 divided by ln of k sub s. It's in units of feet. Just checking here. I'm going to anchor the reference 
divided by 3.7 times the diameter that we came up with from the previous one. All right. Plus, just trying to keep track of whether I've done all my parentheses correctly here. Yeah, plus 5.74 divided by the Reynolds number to the power of 0.9. And then that is to the power of 2. So my updated F value is 0 0.0237. That's a pretty big jump. From here, in, from iteration 2 to iteration 3, the change in F value is going to be a lot more subtle. It's going to, it's not going to, you know, this more than doubled the F value because our first one was just a guess. This next one was actually using realistic relative roughness and it was using an actual Reynolds number. So now the diameter, I can just copy and paste the equation. I don't have to type it in again. So I can say control C, control V, and just to prove it's doing it correctly, I can look at, it's still referencing all of those constants up top, and the only thing new that it's looking at is the updated F value from iteration two. Okay, so we have a new diameter, the new area, control C, control V, new velocity, copy and paste, new Reynolds number, copy and paste, and actually, I don't have to, uh, copy and paste them one at a time. I can copy and paste all of them. So that's what I'll do for iteration three is I'll just select everything and copy with control C and then down here control V to paste. And so it went from 0 0.0237, now it's 0 0.0229. So it changed a little bit, but look at the diameter. The, so this is saying the diameter required is 0.538. Now it's saying it's 0.535. It's already pretty stabilized in terms of the diameter required and the F value is getting pretty stable as well. If we do one more iteration what we'll see is that now the F value is unchanged. It didn't update the F value at all from the input to the output of this iteration and the diameter is Stabilized as well, 0 0.534, 0 0.534. So um, it's saying, you know, if we round that up because it's 0.5347, then it's uh, 0.538 feet. Now they don't sell pipe diameter exactly 0.538 feet. They sell pipes in increments of inches. And so if we multiply 0.53, uh, 0.535 by 12, that's uh, 6.42 inches. So 6.42 inches. So the pipe sizes that are available would be either six or eight. There isn't a seven inch diameter pipe that's commonly available. If we went with a six inch diameter pipe in this situation, what would happen if we went smaller than is required? This, is, this setup was telling us we need it to be 6.42 inches. So what if we only went with 6 inches? What would be the result? Let's say it's the same elevation difference. It's the same 10 horsepower pump. But instead of the 6.42 inch pipe diameter, we use just a 6 inch, six inch pipe diameter. What would be the result? The water would still flow. It would still get the water there. But the head loss would be more than 23.76 feet for a flow rate of 1.5 cubic feet per second. So what would happen is if you use a pipe that's too small, you just won't be able to achieve your target flow rate. So the water will still flow, but it just wouldn't get to 1.5 cubic feet per second. So what we would do is we would round up. We would over-design rather than under-design. And so buy an 8-inch diameter pipe. So when you buy an 8-inch diameter pipe, 
what that means is that you can more than deliver the required 1.5 cubic feet per second. Now, if they only want exactly 1.5 cubic feet per second, then you're going to have to put in a valve as well. Close off the valve a little bit to reduce the flow rate to get it to exactly where they want. But that's the design here. That's the idea with this iterative pipe sizing when we throw in a pump, is the pump is adding energy, it's lifting the water, overcoming head loss, and uh, that's why the water is flowing from the lower reservoir to the upper reservoir. All right, we are out of time for today. Remember that uh, your homework assignment, which I think has a, an example really similar, no, a, a problem really similar to these examples today. The homework is due on Wednesday. When I give you Excel templates, you can use that as guidance, but don't just use the Excel templates directly for your homework. Start from a blank workbook and uh, set it up yourself rather than just changing a template that I provided you for the homework. So, all right, I'll see you on Wednesday.